Welcome back, Shaye. Adetayo joins us next as a former state security operative to weigh in on the matter. Good morning and thank you for joining us on the program as well today. Now, there are several questions out there. Uh, many are unsatisfied with the kind of response they've gotten from the authorities to the, expect, to the extent that they suspect that there's a lot more going on with this attack. I mean, from your perspective, wearing your cap as, as a former security uh, operative, What's your assessment of what is going on with this? Well, um, this particular attack is one that attacked too many, and it is one that shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Um, quite a lot of people must be held responsible for this because it's, it's difficult for um, the Ministry of Interior, the Prison uh, Correctional Service, to say that, that they are not aware that um, such an attack is being planned. And so the questions that begs answer is, what have they done uh, since they've been receiving intelligence, even from the you know uh, benefit of insight that um, Kujia prison will be attacked based on the, the demands of uh, Abuja Kaduna trained attackers. Um, what have they done? How, how, why is it easy? Why is it that every time there is uh, an incursion into our prisons, we don't see a time when harm squad of the Nigerian Correctional Service will repel an attack. So what is the essence of the uh, arm squad of the NCS? How much of training have they been, been given? Is it a welfare issue? Is it that they are non-existent? Or is it that the weapon they are carrying are not good enough? Why is it that, you know, if you look at this particular attack, no single no single injured NCS officer uh, have been announced so far. And if there is no how such an attack would take place, and there is a response from the Nigerian Correctional Service officers or guards on duty, that you will not see probably someone with a with a gunshot wound or someone with um, someone killed. But when we have a situation where none, it means that is that they drop their weapon and run away, or they carry their weapon and run away. And this is, you know, becoming a frequent scenario. The only time that um, we've seen where uh, attempts at um, attacking the prisons were repelled were done by the Nigerian army. Army personnel deployed immediately into those facilities where. So we've not seen any so far. So see, there's a major issue with um, the way um, the Nigerian Correctional Service is being um, operated or is being run at present. It could be a budgetary issue. It could be manpower issue. And uh, it's also likely a capacity issue. I'm surprised uh, when uh, General Dan Bazao is speaking, he used to be Minister of Interior. The question is that what, I, what did he do while he was Minister of Interior? Because this is part of his legacy. He handed over to, you know, the successor. Yeah. What were they able to do to protect this oh. same facility before handing over? Because if some things have been done while he held sway, no, they could have inherited, I mean, uh, inherited. And they would have you know, Part of what he also did say is that uh, when that occurred at some point while he was there, he did raise that question with the president, but uh, we didn't get to hear if anything has been done about it because today uh, many point to certain things and then conclude that there appears to be some sort of conspiracy at the highest level. Part of the questions you raised is um, no... NCS official has been announced to have been injured or killed, as it were. But not that we're praying for any of that to happen. But the thing is, looking at how this played out, first they say there is no functional CCTV. How is it that they told the president of the Senate that there were about 300 terrorists who came through? How did they get all those figures? How is it that the terrorists had all the time in the world to operate, no response, no repelling of any attack? And you also find out that uh, at the moment, we don't know if they have situation in terms of what transpired at that crime scene, recorded evidence. For instance, have you heard or read, I haven't, of any shell, what kind of weaponry, ammunition that were expelled? So is it then 
with all of these scenarios, is it fair for lay people or people to uh, suspect saying, listen, there's certainly something going on here that the authorities are not telling us? Well, I think the best um, uh, record we have so far is the 30 seconds footage from ISWAP. Uh, showing uh, how they attack the facility. And um, if you look at the MO of ISWAP, you will know that uh, they they will bombard in large numbers uh, and um, the, the kind of weapon that they carry. And uh, some we saw in that video uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of the sound. But see, um, uh, AIG Wilson said something uh, which is important. Uh, and Mark will also emphasize uh, it, and it's uh, as in something that channels have done before. And I can confirm to you that it's a fact that the inmates in the prisons had phones with them. It's not, it's not um, uh, an assumption. They had phones. And, 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 and that's part of the issues with Nigerian Correctional Service. In other climes, Yes, an inmate has um, right to, to be able to communicate with the outside world, but they are regulated. The communications must be done through the centralized uh, communication system, and they are being monitored. But it's becoming a, I mean, a recurrent issue where the waters are compromised. They are the one who help these people to buy the phones, register the lines, and smuggle it in at a fee. They help them to recharge the phones, every now and then. It's not only that. They also sell drugs. They help them to smuggle drugs, weeds, cigarettes into the cells. This is a major issue. That's why I said, no, we need to look at the way the NCS is currently. And it's a pointer uh, to the, uh, this attacks the point of the fact that um, uh, no sooner uh, than, I mean, in a very short time, we might see another attack uh, at Kogi prisons. That is, if they are still housing, you know, high profile, you know, deadly uh, 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 criminals in, in Kogi, because we see several incursions into Kogi uh, because of the caliber of inmates there. And uh, we'll also see in some other prisons, because this has shown that um, we've never learned from you know, uh, experience of the past, and then we continue to do the same thing over and over and over, and they will continue to get the same results. In uh, in the last um, few years now, we've recorded, you know, uh, a lot, I mean, you know, you know mind-blowing uh, numbers of attacks on our prisons. And, you know, a, a government that is um, really, really concerned about Taking those people out of circulation should have done something about it. Now our focus is at is on the Boko Haram terrorists. We're forgotten, we're neglecting the fact that there are murderers that escaped, hassonists, pedophiles, rapists, big time scammers, ritualists among the people we are looking for. And if you if you're judging from the experience, a uh, recent experience. The first thing they do is to go on revenge mission. The people who put them in the jail, those who testified against them, they go straight to those communities and kill them. And then how many, at the prison break, how many have you recovered? The, the, the condemned criminals, the, 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 the ones with long time, and those ones that uh, are, are, are big time uh, criminals, deadly criminals, how many? Emo, emo prison attack, how many? There's several attacks. On Kogi prisons, how uh, pri prison? How many have we been able to recover? These people. The problem yeah. in South East today is as a result of the Edo. Well, Mr. Lisa, just, and just one prison. moment, if if you don't mind uh, me butting in. I mean, there has been that you know trail, just as you have said, and one wonders when it will end. And you just dropped another bombshell. Now it will seem that if we are not careful, we could actually see another one within the shortest possible time, and that's scary. But you talked about the MO of uh, these guys the other time and the accounts that we've read, you know, in the media about, you know, how they went about this is very, very concerning. There are those who say, look, even before this thing happened, there were people meandering, you know, loitering around the, the, the perimeter of the, of the service, of the, of the facility. 
and the residents were seeing them. And, you know, they, even the residents were suspecting this is not normal. These people, you know, milling around, it's not a normal occurrence, but they are there. It would seem like no one was challenging them. Even if there was any challenge to any one of them, it didn't hold any water clearly. My mind right now is about what exactly is happening to the residents around that place who had to go through all that they had to go through. But, you know, you are not a psychologist. That's not a question for you. How do we prevent this, especially with the people meandering around these facilities? These things don't just happen. You also heard, you, you cited the Edo, you know, example the other time. Those who are saying, look, even before that attack happened, there were people milling around. And it would seem like they, they just continued unattacked, un, 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 unchallenged by anyone. From a security uh, perspective, from an intelligence perspective, how should we be dealing with this, especially in the light of the fact that they had, we had security information? I've always believed that intelligence, we always have them. Action in them, that's the challenge. How do we prevent this when we have, especially when we have intelligence? You just dropped one now. Okay, um, to start with, I'm a psychologist. And okay. I'm just, uh, if not for us, I will have but my PhD in psychology. Uh, as, as we speak. My apologies. I so, <laughs> but, 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 but that's not what, what, what we're discussing right now. You see, um, there's a problem with the, the way the prison facility is being structured. And uh, one thing, when you are building something like that, something in security we call uh, crime prevention through environmental design. You need to look at where the location is and take advantage of uh, some of the uh, some of the, um, the, the 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 environment to build security uh, architecture such that um, incursion uh, will be difficult because by the time you layer your security, I mean your security around that facility. It will be difficult. You no, know, the closer you get to the to the center, the more difficult it becomes. But we've not actually seen this, and we've ex we've been expecting that um, over the years, uh, this would have been put uh, into 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 effect. Because I've visited several prisons in Nigeria, and I can tell you for a fact that um, this is not the the case. You see, it is difficult for us to say people cannot come to the prison. Um, the inmates have right for uh, right to to visitors, and uh, there are people who who are families to the NCS because most of the buildings you see around are actually accommodations for NCS officers. They have families, they have children. But the problem is that the facility should have been designed in such a way that there have been several layers where. The, 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 the level where you see those people will be far away from the center. And there have been other layer that will have prevented that, you know, you go through screening, one screening, two screening, three, before you even get into the main gate. But this, we, uh, we, 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 we are not seeing. You see, right now, this is what government should start doing now. It's not about gun. It's not about the number of armed men that you put in the facility. The cheapest way for you to protect such facility, it is through restructuring of, I mean, of, 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 of the architectural design of our prison. That is number one. Number two, I will expect that the president will call Council of State meeting right now and address the governors. Bring in all the past president and address the governors. Mr. Governor, if you cannot sign death warrants, Please don't go for re-election. This is not you don't become a governor and then and I'll be arrested by moral burden. This there are a lot of those people have been condemned to death. Case closed, a because Supreme Court over 25 years. And in all the prisons where we've had this incursion, all the condemned criminals are gone. They are out there. They've not been able to recover five of the condemned criminals that escaped the dead. And what these people will do is that because it's difficult for them to be reintegrated into the society, they go back into the underworld and continue crimes. And how do we continue to keep people that are deadly, murderers, people who have killed several people and the, 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 the prosecution have done their work, the court have, uh, has, has done its own work, and, and, and the prison you know, has, has been able to hold them while this process, all it requires is for the state governors to sign and then let the process be, be completed. Number one, it will help to decongest. Number two, it will reduce the risk and threats 
in all our prisons because they constitute the highest or the greatest level of threat. Because they are the one that you must provide the highest level of restriction and control over. And we continue to keep those people there. This has to be looked into. And also, the third thing that I, I believe that federal government should do right now is to decentralize our prison system. Let the state, the state be able to build a prison. And so that what this would do is that all those issues around lesser crimes, people, you know, that have committed traffic offense, uh, they are taken to court, court charge them. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, they have been sentenced to three months in prison. What, and you see all of them in Kirikiri. You see them in uh, in, uh, in in different different prisons. You know, mingling with those ones that are condemned, mingling with those ones that are still going for uh, going to trial for murder, for treason, for terror terrorism, and the rest. You see, this because. These people are carrying less, uh, I mean, uh, are, are facing offenses with lesser, uh, lesser uh, charges. There is limit to the level of restrictions you can give to them. So this makes the prison's you know, level of restrictions to be varied. And this leads to compromise. You see many of these people's family coming because the issues around this set uh, of image are not so strong. So we need to allow the state to build its own prison so that this calibers of um, this caliber of, um, of, 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 of image you know, can be you know, in state prisons. And federal prisons will be able to take care of those that are you know, facing federal charges, federal crimes, treason, you know, terrorism, and, 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 and high level, high caliber, you know, crimes. And they will be able to build, you know, effective um, security around those facilities. And also, the numbers of those people in those facilities will be reduced. So there are quite a lot of things that we need to do in the immediate right now. It's not just about moving the military. How many, how many, um, I mean, um, personnel we have in Nigerian armed forces today? They are fighting in northeast. They are fighting in northwest. They are there trying to make uh, the southeast to be habitable right now. And then you want to start deploying them into all the prisons in Nigeria to be able to keep all those people. The Congress has to do their work. Yeah, it may seem like we have a lot of time to wait for the government to begin to do their work in terms of, you know, solution to this very big challenge. But we can't ask enough, you know, we can't ask enough questions on accountability and I'd like to follow up on Chamberlain's point earlier uh, with this about the uh, conclusion or the suggestion of the Senate President's visit yesterday that what happened must have been done with the help of an insider. Now does this lend credence to reports from the day before also that soldiers in charge of Kujay prison were withdrawn 24 hours before the attack and if indeed you know there is complicity at the highest level on the Kujay prison attack what would be the goal what would be the agenda you know perhaps you have um, some insights to share on this you see um we'll still have to wait for for the outcome of the investigation uh, most of the things we are hearing now are uh, Best at, at best, ESA. Um, the first thing I had was that um, it was a routine relief, uh, uh, relief of uh, officers on duty being replaced by new ones, which is routine, and it's, it follows, you know, the the, the 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 routine and the calendar. So, to me, if that is the case, it's it's not something that um, uh, is unusual. But if they were removed and they were not replaced, then I can say probably they tried to. You know, reduce the, the the security coverage of the environment, but that uh, uh, that in itself is not. Um, uh, uh, I mean, there are all that things that we need to consider, and I've seen these times without numbers. My understanding of someone carrying arms, or if you are working in a regimented organization, military or paramilitary, is that when you are on duty, you must be hundred percent at a lot, you must perform your duty, make all your, uh, uh, I mean, uh, your, your patrol checks with full and 100% attention. But that is not the case in Nigeria. And I'm saying this so that the authorities need to address this. A situation where somebody that is on duty, 
that is standing on guard duty will be leaving the duty post at every prayer time. At every prayer time. When it is time for prayers, they will leave their duty post to go and pray. We are allowing, see, a soldier, an arm carrying person, you are not an ordinary person. It's never done. Even Islamic countries, religious countries, countries, Vaticans, if you are on duty, when they are praying, you don't join them. You do your prayer with your vigilance. Even, I remember even in the Bible, where they were rebuilding Jerusalem, the Bible said that they were, they were building with one hand and using one hand to carry spear. You are supposed to be on the watch 24-7 when you are on duty. We need to address this. Bauchi attack that brought us to where we are today was as the result of the people on guard duty. They left their duty post close to Eid to go and do prayer. They were praying when these people attacked. The people who also attacked, they are also religious there as well. But that particular point is that they suspended their prayers to carry out the attack. They know that they can always recover the prayer. And they know that our people would definitely leave their own duty to pray. Anyone that is on duty to protect a facility, God, our agency should ensure that they must not be allowed to leave the facility to go and pray. Look right, at the so, time that the attack happened. Yeah, no, you, you raise a very uh, crucial and interesting points there. Because if they're able to at attempt and attack the president's advanced convoy, who says tomorrow they cannot attempt to attack the villa? So, you know, when... And the facts are clear for themselves about this matter, because we've seen the way the security agencies can respond when it had to do with uh, uh, Sunday Boho, for instance. We've seen the way the authorities can respond when it has to do with uh, uh, IPOP, for instance. And these kind of things, security agencies don't just unilaterally act. They act based on instructions and directive. And we've also seen the way they act when it comes to these kind of issues. And so it just comes, it looks as though, wait a minute, is somebody just not giving the directive and giving the order and allowing these terrorists have a free reign? Because you started out saying they should have known that they were going to attack this prison because these people had been demanding they release some of their people who were in Kujie. And now, if the, now that these ones have escaped, 64, they've not told us what is going on with that 64, Kogi might be the next. And nothing might be done, and then Kogi is attacked, we come back to this kind of scenario because chances are, from what we've seen with these attacks, this can happen again. That's why people say there's certainly more questions than the authorities are not telling us about this. You see, um, one thing I can tell you for a fact is that, um, aside the fact that um, from benefit of insight, that they should know that the attack is going to take place, is the fact that um, they actually got intelligence. Wow. The problem we have is not for death of intelligence. In fact, I read it somewhere that even on that same day, earlier that same day, they got intelligence that attack is going to take place uh, on that facility. Now, the issue is this. Intelligence products are classified and they are directed to a particular consumer that they expect that uh, whether a policymaker or an action agency. And when it is directed to, to these people, there are recommendations that comes with every intelligence product that has been disseminated, and it will be highlighted. In view of you know, the foregoing, uh, it is advised that you, you carry out one, two, three, four, five. In the immediate, one, two, three, four, five. Medium term, one, two, three, four, five. No long-term measures. Intelligence, when not, it is not for death of intelligence, but this is where the problem lies. And you will be a witness to this, that some of this intelligence, after it has been shared with this agency, they will cascade it down without, you know, applying appropriate classification and appropriate protection to those information. To the extent that even some of these people will photocopy it and put it on social media. So the intelligence are there. 
this is not properly handled or managed. You see, we need to really go deep down. In our official secret act, in our constitution, our official secret act, there is something that is called um, uh, security standing order. The security standing order puts, you know, uh, espoused all the actions each government department, organization, and agency are supposed to put in place for information and document security. It is expected of them to even establish the office of departmental security officer. Check all the parasites. How many of them are having the office of the DSO? These are part of what, right. what, what the law says that to help us to be able to manage information, government document, classified information that gets into their hands. This information, as it has been given to them, ends up in the hands of the enemies. Because right, these people are even selling information. It's yeah. so bad. Well, we um, uh, were doing this such that uh, the authorities will at least be there to address these concerns and ensure that they don't happen. Well, the president has visited the place. We're waiting to see what next steps will be taken on this matter. Thank you for talking to us today, Shay Adetai, a former state security operative. Thank you so much. All right. We're back in a minute. Don't go away. <laughs>